It has a small chirping bellows inside, so this doesn't have a full song, but the surprise inside of the basket is a small chick, and at, in between the music you get this little chirping sound happening when the basket opens up. Uh, Roulet and Decomp, one of the other big firms, uh, started with John Roulet and, and eventually the Roulet uh, family married uh, to Decomp and it became R&D or Roulet and Decomp. And then eventually, in the, uh, towards the early 1900s, uh, it moved into solely Gaston Decomp or Decomp. And they were actually in business in Paris, Decomp factory. Uh, when I was going to Paris and doing research at the Patents Bureau in the 1970s, late 70s, they were still in business. The Decom had a storefront and they were still in business there at the old location in Paris. Uh, so it was very interesting. Uh, if, you, if you could peek or get access to the workshops in the back, uh, they were still had loads of old parts and pieces to a lot of the animals. They were really known widely for a lot of the animals later on in life uh, during their tenure in the, the 1940s, 50s, 60s making all sorts of shoemakers, cobblers, uh, musicians, violin players, fiddle players, all in cats, dogs, uh, all the walking, a lot of the walking figures, a lot of the pouncing tigers or roulette de calm. Uh, they were very well known for that. And one of them, of course, was the walking peacock, which is a, a beautiful piece. Uh, this is one of our own in the Guinness collection. They made these in three different sizes. Uh, ours is the, uh, the middle size. Uh, there is a smaller one uh, that makes it very petite. Uh, when the feathers are down, the whole piece is no more than two feet about in length. Uh, and as they strut across the, the floor or your table, uh, they're really quite exciting. The, tables, or the, the tail feathers will eventually raise and then fan out. Also the head sort of goes from side to side very elegantly. We had the opportunity to acquire, my brother and myself, um, uh, privately, uh, have access to and acquire one of the small models of this, of the, the three, as well as one of the middle ones that have been very badly treated and stored or cared for over their lifetime. Very few original feathers. Some, somebody along the line tried to refeather this, this poor fellow. Uh, with a whole different variety of feathers than what originally would have been on it. Uh, so they needed complete restoration. Uh, at the same time, my brother and I found a uh, toy restorer, uh, the Wallers, up in Maine. And they had just finished doing one of the uh, middle size, I think it was, of the peacocks, the really big on peacocks. They did such a marvelous job. Again, why, why try to reinvent the wheel? Go right to the source that has the original, can get the proper peacock feathers and do a very efficient job. Uh, and we were able to get both pieces done through the Wallers. They took exceptional photographs as they were disassembling the pieces and seeing all the paper mache damages, the replacements, the clockwork mechanism, getting everything to work correctly. Here you can see the, the framework that holds the tail feathers for the peacock in the up and fanned out position. These are all very compact because the mechanisms are about the size of, of the palm of your hand. Here, one of them, the, the head had to be completely remanufactured because one was missing completely. Uh, so th this is a, a, carved, a carved body that made the mold for the pattern for the palm of the and then peacock feathers over. Peacock feathers are not, are, have been farmed, they're not a protected species underneath the CITES or the CITES Protected Species uh, uh, Acts uh, by the federal government here in the States or even internationally uh, because they've been farm raised for household and domestic purposes for so long, which is another issue I'll, I'll get into a little bit later on another project. But here is that one of those peacocks completely uh, refeathered and done. And here's a, a video of it.
You see, he elegantly just turns his head from side to side. Just looks like, did you see what I just did? <laughs> Do you want to see it again? <laughs> And that leads me into where I started with, with the protected species uh, to a certain degree. One, another project that very recently came in to our uh, home workshop was a singing bird in cage clock uh, that was signed by John, James Burrell, uh, who was a very well known uh, clock maker uh, and uh, automata, certain automata maker back in the early 1800s, late 70s, early 1800s. Uh, this has the clock not on the bottom, but actually in one of the front side panels. Uh, but it also had a, one of those very similar, uh, and actually was now attributed to Jacques Edro, bird, bird small pipe organ mechanisms hidden within the base itself. Uh, as you can see, the, as arrived in the shop, the bird form is extremely different than any of the Bonton pieces and very different from Ferro, Schapp, or Frizzard, or the other early makers from the 1700s. This actually had a uh, fruit wood body shell, carved, extremely thin, very, very delicate, uh, in order to house uh, the inner mechanism of the body, which you can see the scalable framework in the middle slide. Uh, they were copper metal wings that were perforated, uh, so that the glue that would hold the, uh, uh, the feathering that would happen later, hold them through, because uh, they're feathered on both sides and let you apply the glue, then the glue seats through both sides of the hole, so it really helps stabilize the feather being glued to a very hard metal surface, which sometimes the, the glues, uh, adhesives don't like to do on occasion. They prefer porous surfaces, so this is their one way to get around that and ensure that the feathers stay in place for as long as possible. This is a, a shot of the organ mechanism, a close-up of the pin brass barrel inside of it, as well as the uh, brass piccolo pipes with stoppers uh, that are actually fixed, soldered into place. Once they're in the proper location, they're a little dab of solder, so there's no retuning these pipes. They are tuned specifically the way the manufacturer, when it left, uh, playing the songs that it originally would have. The process of uh, restoring the bird and re repairing both sides of the halves of the body shell. Uh, the body shell is held in place by a little ringlet that goes down to cast bronze little bird feet. Uh, so they're pinned and then cut off uh, right in, and they're pinned directly into the framework on the inside of the body as well. So it becomes very, very stable. This, this, these are views that have been in no book and no publication and no research papers uh, from anyone who's had the early Jacques Adro birds apart. Uh, it, it's like one of those things that unless you know another technician who has been inside of one of these, and can get access to photographs. Once you open it up, you don't know what you're just you're discovering, you're rediscovering how that original manufacturer designed it and actually manufactured it. Again, it's part of that reverse engineering in order to discover uh, know, know how to get into something without doing more damage. So you can do the proper conservation treatments or repairs and then work your way back out without uh, without showing outward signs that you're changing it dramatically. And of course, everything nowadays is supposed to be reversible. So you don't use synthetic glues that are not reversible. Paints, feathering, and the feathering is another one of those issues. <clears throat> the, uh, what I mentioned before, CITES, the C-I-T-E-S, -E -I -E um, is an uh, international um, understanding an agreement between um, many different countries that now are strictly enforcing uh, non, 
non-dealing uh, in precious and endangered species, whether it's ivory uh, from elephant tusks, whether it's uh, bone, uh, whether it's tortoise shell, uh, rosewood, uh, ebony's sometimes, ivory, uh, of course, and on this particular bird, <coughs> an ivory beak, two upper and lower, because the beak is animated, the lower beak moves. So the, in, in restoring these pieces nowadays, uh, conservators and restorers have to choose and use non-protected species feathers and non-materials that are well documented and in case the piece has to move and is purchased or shipped outside of the country and in some areas like the United States even transiting in state to state is illegal in protected species. So bird feathers, songbirds, protected songbirds are no longer can be used in a lot of different cases in these pieces. So on this one, enough research and experience led me to chicken feathers, unprotected chicken feathers. In a very certain area, and the hackle is used, and sometimes you've got to go through two or three hackles from a chicken in order to get the proper size feathers you need. And even then, you're not using the whole feather, you're using a piece, a morsel of that feather. Every one of them has to be broken down to become the size that you need. And that's besides the coloring. Now you've got to color and dye them with aniline dyes so they, they last a long time. Uh, so here you can see the body's been put back on the bird. Everything is working mechanically on the inside. And now you have to start with the tweezers and apply feather by feather with, with high glue. So this is fully reversible if it ever needs to be stripped again without harming the wood. It can be lightly treated with moisture, a drop of water, a cotton swab. It will reactivate the hot high glue, and then it will release the feather, and you don't have damage to the piece. So it can be refeathered in the future as well. Yes? Just a quick question. Uh, you said the beak is ivory. Um, if it, how does that apply to uh, interstate travel? I mean, if, if, uh, if it's a grand, is it grandfathered in, it's an original part? <coughs> Many of them not. Uh, we, we have not seen uh, any strict enforcement on state-to-state -state basis. Uh, where you do see it is antique dealers that have uh, carved figures, bronze castings with ivory insets. Even some of the, like the grease bombs singing bird, or uh, singing, the carved wooden figures that have singing bird mechanisms, but they whistle a tune, carved whistlers that were made by grease bomb. And they're, they're all over the world. A lot of those models have ivory insets into the wood for the cuffs, the buttons, some, some of the, the other uh, aspects. If you have one of those at an antique show as a dealer and you sell it, uh, you're technically not supposed to be transiting in protected species. So you shouldn't really be selling the ivory. You can sell the wood, but you can't sell the ivory. Customs officials internationally of uh, God is acto knives and they're stripping birds, pop-up singing birds of hummingbird feathers or the ivory beaks, and then handing it back to you after customs uh, and say, here's your piece, it, it's a protected species. Uh, we have to destroy this material. Uh, so it's, it, every once in a while, uh, you, you can file uh, appeals after a decision is made once they've seize the object and not clear it for customs clearance. Uh, but you better have a good attorney and a really good argument uh, in order to justify why that piece shouldn't be stripped of those protected species materials. It, it's a headache. It is a royal headache for a lot of people. Sometimes, sometimes you get away with it, you know, but it, it's becoming more and more of an issue. So you, you, here domestically, state to state, there's Right now, virtually no enforcement of that, unless somebody uh, who's from Fish and Wildlife shows up at an antique show and then sees a singing bird under dome piece from Bonton and all this material. It's like that dealer should not be selling those feathers. He can sell the glass dome, he can sell the mechanism, he can sell everything else. But, but the, the bird feathers ought to be for free, you're not charging for it. That's one way, but you're going to have to argue your way out of it. Yeah. That there's no easy, that's interpretive. Case by case interpretive is what it's ending up being. Uh, so 
So it's an interesting field, but it's one that's evolving pretty quickly. Here's my workbench with a whole mess of feathers, and you can see the size that they're down to. That's a hackle that I'm um, starting to pluck that's been dyed red. <clears throat> Another one black, and then going through. It may not look like a lot, but there's a, just under 3,000 feathers hand applied to that bird. And that bird is no bigger than uh, about three to three and a half inches in that range in length. And the beaks, the beaks had to be removed. Uh, and there I actually recarved those out of Durlin, white Durlin, which is used as a, a replicant uh, material for ivory. <laughs> and this is piece completed. train your home pet canary, you would go to it, and there was no cleaning up the cage afterward either. <laughs> and I brought a few of the pieces uh, with me here that I can demonstrate uh, from the Guinness Collection as well as from uh, Belinda Singe, who very kindly brought this, uh, the singing bird in cage on the far end of the table in for uh, me to demonstrate for you. And I'll field any questions, yes. Jerry, repeat the question, please. I can't hear. Oh, the question was the design of the bellows and uh, the, what's producing the air pressure. And the way these were designed, uh, many of them, the majority, is two pump bellows. So you've got, when, when the action is going in one direction, it's pumping one bellow, and it's going the other, it's pumping the second pump bellow. And both of those are feeding a reservoir. And the reservoir bellows should hold the, um, and maintain a certain amount of uh, air pressure necessary to keep the song going. So there's also a calculation with how many pipes are sounding at the same, how much air is being used, and the bellows have to be engineered size-wise to supply the necessary amount of air pressure. Is the reservoir rigid or flexible No, the, the bellows are actually rigid, usually rigid boards or in very small pieces, sometimes metal. Uh, and uh, there's leather use, usually a cabretta or some kind of pouch leather that's sealed in order to, the, the leather seals those compartments and then there's valves inside that allow the air to flow only in one direction to be loaded and then pushed out, loaded in one direction and then pushed out in another direction towards a reservoir. There's a, a, a book we have in the gift shop. If you haven't seen it, uh, it's called Figures in the Fourth Dimension by Ellen Rixford. It's 80 pages and it's, uh, she, she and I, well, she spent probably five years working on that book. And there's an entire chapter on automata. And uh, several, several of them are basically automata are focused, the pieces in the Guinness collection and they've been broken down as schematics and explained piece by piece within it. So it, you really should take a look at that book and breeze through the, the copy in there and see if you want to add it to your library. It, it's a great resource for how puppetry and mechanical movement in figural pieces are all designed, whether it be a contemporary piece or whether it uh, be a document of the antique originals on how they actually operate on the inside out. Uh, was it done in proportion to the, the regular scale of a peacock? No, they made that in three different sizes. 
and the largest, uh, the largest of the three is real, real life size. There, there are only a few of them that really exist. Um, most of them are the small and the medium sized ones that you see out there. The, the side sword bend, was that always a um, true to the piece, the side sword bend that sort of hung down, that always looked like a wing? Uh, well, those were depicted in the original catalog drawing. That's why they were replicated on this. Because of where they're located, near the support struts on the middle size one, uh, those were the first ones to disappear. Because <laughs> they're near the ground, they're where everyone usually grabs hold of to wind it, or to, to operate the stop start, which is in the front area of the chest. So those are always the first ones to lose. They're also fairly fragile. Yeah. In comparison to the tail. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? I, I do have a question. Sure. Um, can you use feathers that have been molted from protecting nope. birds? Uh, if, if they can identify them as a protected species, which is literally all songbirds, if they identify it, it's up to you to prove them wrong. If you're guilty until proven, you know, and that's the way customs usually is, is operating on these kind of circumstances. Yes. Jerry, when did they start that? When did this go into effect about the... Oh, CITES is, uh, boy, I forgot what year they enacted that. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, well, I mean, we, we started hearing about it probably 20 years ago. Uh, but it, it's taken quite a long time to, for customs to come up to speed to become more enforceful and also have more of their own staff that actually can identify these pieces uh, as two species. So like in the last five years is when they've just gotten stricter? Mm -hmm. I would say 10, yeah, I would say 10, 10 years. I mean, it, it's, it came on our radar screen uh, because of really antiquities out there that were being stripped of ivory in sculptural work from the 1500s. And then we were reading the antique magazines and, and the, the, they were writing articles about this warning dealers internationally, watch out. Uh, and then it's just been a matter of time before they have staff that have come up to speed with it, easy, more easily uh, identifying what those protected species are, and then culling them out and saying, once they say, okay, open this up, we got to check this, then, then you're in, you know, it depends what their findings are, and it could vary each time around a little bit. Yes? There are preserved butterflies in New Zealand, Australia, where they're conserved, they're always contained. So they're allowed to pick up the dead ones. Mm -hmm. So you can get the butterfly wing. Yeah. Because they, they don't have a similar thing for birds. Nope. Uh, well, no, you can pick them up. I mean, if a bird dies, you can pick it up, you can own it. You, 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 you can take it home. They, no. It's not endangered so. anymore, it's dead. Yeah, I, I know, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter to customers. If you're selling it, so you're, they haven't found if, a way around. if you're transiting in it, and transit doesn't, it, uh, it means moving across the border with it, yeah. uh, and or selling it for a monetary sum, either in swap or trade or goods or cash. And uh, it, that's where they've got full they discretion. Uh, and so, it, you know, uh, you, you got to be careful. And you know, because if they, um, if customs so decides, they can seize it, and then it's up to you to prove, to disprove their finding. And you can petition, and you know, they won't destroy it right away. It's put in storage in a pile, marked, bagged, tagged, everything. So I mean, they can they can track it until it actually goes to an incinerator to, to get destroyed. Yeah. There, there is a way to do it. There, there, for museums, it's a little bit easier uh, because you, you've got the credentials behind you to try to do that. From loans, again, you're not selling it, you're not really in a, you're, you might be loaning it, so it's in motion across borders. 
but uh, you can get waivers for that kind of thing, and museums can get that. But if you're selling it or buying it, you're not going to get a waiver for something like that. Uh, the likelihood is slim to none. You can always try, and but it all depends on who you reach and how good the argument is and what their findings are. Even under those circumstances, you, you hit stats because I got a friend that was the historian at Carnegie Hall. Jerry, we cannot hear this. Oh, sorry, I had a friend. No, please was, repeat the question. Um, My, my original question was about how museums can have issues about transiting things that are 200 years old. Even, even a follow-up would be, why do they seize items, that, even personal items, like these that are 200 years old, that obviously the birds weren't endangered at the time and, and so forth. But what I was, the other thing I was going to mention is, I have a friend at Carnegie Hall that was trying to import from a museum in Europe, I think it was Gustav Mailer's baton that had ivory in it, and even though it was, was not being sold, it was just being you know, presented in, in Carnegie Hall, they wouldn't let it through. If, uh, my main point is you have to be aware of that. It's going to be, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, if they wanted to make it that way, it will be a challenge. Sometimes there's ways around it, but uh, you, you have to cross your fingers that everything is going to work in your favor. Uh, it's tricky. Is this the new reason why you hear on permanent loan from one museum to another because they can't be sold anymore? No, I, I don't think that. I, you know, uh, our, our director, Andy, might have a, a more concise answer to that question. But I don't think it's related to the protected species uh, efforts, you might say. Well, if that's it, come on up. I'll play these uh, instruments.